Let's mix and match. You need to mix and match when you have subs with diverse data. Diverse data comes from a number of things. You've taken pictures on different lights, different scopes. Maybe your camera was at a different rotation. Why do these things happen? Well, it could be because you goofed. And it could be because you uh, are trying something different. But in either case, you need to mix and match. This is one of the top 20 questions on cloudy nights. Now, it gets asked in different ways. Here's one week's worth. And the questions were asked, how do I combine images with different camera settings, different temp and set points? How do I handle multi-session processing? Um, how, what's the most economical and effective way to stack? And um, how do I use a mono for detail with a DSLR for color? Why do we need this? Well, here's an example from Stephen Curran. And, and Stephen, thank you for letting me use your picture here as an example. Notice he took a picture on successive nights, but his camera was at a slightly different rotation each night. And he wants to know what can he do about it? Well, for one thing, he can get a darn good picture out of that data if he stays calm and just uses it appropriately. But all of these issues are related to the fact that they are using diverse data. And the solution when you're using diverse data is in the calibration and the registration. Calibration corrects for defects in deficiencies and equipment. It does that with three types of calibration images. Your biases and dark uh, correct for errors in the camera, temperature differences, gain or ISO differences, and hot and cold pixels. And uh, your optics are corrected by flats. These include vignetting and dust spots. And it's really easy to remember what to do in these cases if you have multi-sessions. You calibrate your light frames with calibration frames that match directly. That's simple enough to remember. What does it mean? Well, for biases and darks, there's some questions that are always getting asked. Uh, yes. They can be taken at a different time. They don't need to be taken the night of the exposures of the lights. They're reusable for a while. You need to match the temperature and gain, and you need, need to match the time of exposure for darks. Now, there is some scaling involved, and you might not need biases for your particular rig, but this in general is good advice to follow. As far as correcting for the optics with flats, then you need it at close to the same focus. Often it's asked, do I have to be precise? Well, even during the night, your change, focus changes a little bit. So you need to get as close as you can, but don't obsess over it. It should be at the same rotation in the optical tube. Um, and you need to have matching filters. Um, if your filter has rotated at all, you must take new uh, exposures. If nothing has moved, you can reuse flats for multiple nights. You're at a star party for four or five nights, so one set of flats will do as long as you don't move your camera. The important thing to remember is that calibration frames much, must match your light frames no matter what session you took them in. Now, what happens if you can't do that? If you can't match it precisely, well, Try to recreate it. Put your rig back together the same way it was, same rotation as much as possible, and take the pictures again for your flats. Or just fake it. Do the best you can, and maybe you're stuck with a paintbrush in Photoshop taking out a, a, a dust bunny or something. But do the best you can with that. Registration is easy enough to explain. Here are two pictures of the North American Nebula, quite different, one taken with an ASI 071 on a Samyang 135, and two years before that, my Canon 6D on uh, NP101 was taking some images, and this star is that star. This wall of the North America Nebula is this wall over here. So it's the same thing. I'm gonna have to rotate, scale, and translate this picture to make them match. 
Uh, rotation is pretty easy. You can see that I can, I got two images here. I come up over and pick Synsight and various other programs can do the same thing. Change the geometry. So I just rotated 180 degrees. And now you can see that the orientation of this star to the North America, to the North American nebula itself is the same in both pictures. Going on to scale, scale is adjusting something for size. I want to use part of this and part of that, so I need to get a match approximately in size. Uh, by the way, this is not how I would actually do it, you know, using the zoom factors on the screen and things like this. But for illustration purposes, this is what scaling is, making the one picture match approximately the same size as the other picture. And you can see when I've done that, the two North American nebulas are about the same size. Transition is also very simple. You can move your one picture up and down in relation or left and right in relation to the other one. That's translation. Now, in fact, it's not done by moving things around with your cursor. Um, but before we go too far down that road, um, I want you to remember registration is a standard procedure. You use it in all of your imaging. When you're binning, before and after meridian flips, when you're dithering, these are things you do on every session, uh, not just diverse data. And so you're c comfortable using registration. You use it every time you uh, process. Um, mosaics, uh, you have to use them in order to light up the various uh, panels of the mosaic. If you have different image scales, different fields of view or different optics because you've goofed or you've tried an experiment, you still have to use registration. You use it all the time. I want to use this North American nebula and register it with this one so I can use the two pictures together. I don't need all of this area here and I don't absolutely have to do this, but I'm going to first crop out a bunch of stuff I don't want in this image. So I open up my dynamic crop to fix inside and you can do whatever you want to do in your own processing program to do the same thing. And you know, you know how to crop. So I'm not going to show you that. Take that time. Just get it out of the way. I've already done it for you here. Get this into that. The way I do that is with my star alignment, which is what PixInsight calls registration. And I choose this from my reference frame. I choose that for the frame that I'm going to be work registering. And now I put them together and with a bunch of well, whirring and clanging and stuff like that, it takes a few seconds to produce an image after rotating, scaling, and translating. And you can see that, uh, well, you can't see anything yet. So let's make it a little bit brighter by pushing up over here on the radioactive button. And it'll give me a screen function. And you can see that these two images of the North American Nebula are now registered. There's still a problem up here where I don't have an area covered. And that's going to cost me a problem in the future. See the two images. You can see that right here, we have that area that wasn't covered by anything over here. How is this going to cause us a problem? Look at Stephen's image. See here? Over here? And Stephen was asking, how do I get this so that I, I can, how, can, how do I cure this problem? Well, it's very difficult to cure this problem. Unless you're a genius processor, you're not going to get this particular chunk over here to match that to match this, to match that. They've just got different numbers of subframes supporting each of these areas. But with the creative use of cropping and further processing, you can get yourself a real nice picture. So don't give up, don't throw out any pixels. In order to avoid these problems in the first place, it's best if you do in-camera registration. It's best always if you have the same target in rotation. And there here are four things to think about it, about how to get it. One is you can use centering with plate solving. You just get the coordinates of the rotation for what you want, and you tell your plate solver to get it there. Uh, SGP, Nina, Voyager, they all do it. Coordinates, rotation from other images is where you can get your uh, coordinates and rotations. You either look in the FITS header, and I'll show you that in a minute, or you can take an image and plate solve it, 
and get the central coordinates and perhaps the rotation. Take a few, uh, take a minute to do that and then go ahead and use your go to to get there. Take a few test exposures. If you've already gotten images on a different night in a previous session, go ahead and use the target parameters from that earlier run from your earlier target definition, as you see here in um, uh, Sequence Generator Pro. Then if you don't have any of those facilities available to you, you're just using a sky tracker on a tripod or something, go to where you think you're supposed to take the picture, take a test image and see if you've got it. If you don't, adjust a little bit, take another image. Iteratively keep taking your pictures until you've got pictures that match as well as you possibly can. That's what you do need to do to get in-camera registration. Here I promised I would show you a Fitz header. Here's a hamburger galaxy and uh, the Fitz header, a little small to read, so I blew it up over here. You've got your right ascension and your declination marked here. You've also got the camera angle, 90.32. And so you can match it in your, um, um, in your plate solver so that you can get the same image again. Also, it's wise to set the same exposure and set temp. Now, maybe you goofed and you didn't do this, but this is what you should do if you can get it right in the first place. And all this information can be found in your Fitz header. But beware that you'll still get variations based on seeing conditions, observing conditions, and things like that. So this hasn't solved all your problems. You're still going to get some diverse data. You handle that with normalization or linear fit, which is a type of normalization. And the whole idea is that um, you can take pictures on various nights, and you can see we've got 300 seconds and 600 second exposures, and they're going to look differently depending on, uh, they're going to look different uh, depending on the amount of exposure they've got. Well, normalization makes it so that all of the backgrounds have the same values, and this is one of the things you might need to use in order to, to regularize your data. I mentioned before cropping. You can see how it's very hard to get this whole image. You can't, can't, can't get the background anymore, but at least you can still get a real nice image. Now, so there's some questions that arise about stacking. In particular, should I stack everything together or should I stack them separately by each night? Or what should I do? What stacking does is it rejects the outliers that averages the rest. It lines up the values for all of the different subframes in, a, in an array. And then it picks the highest of those and the lowest of those, the ones that are really so far out of the range of everything else that they can't be real. And it throws them out. And then it averages the rest. And with all averages, the more you have samples, the more samples you have, the better the average is going to be. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. If, for instance, you've taken a thousand uh, subframes, it takes a computer a long time to do this with a thousand subframes. So you may want to break that down into a uh, smaller subsets. But uh, best if you can, uh, best if you can do it all at once and calibrate all at the same time, uh, and stack rather all at the same time. So the important thing to do when you're stacking is to calibrate your matching lights and calibration frames. Always match your calibration frames to your lights. Debare the one shot color and use your sharpest reference frame for one registration run if you can. Integrate them all together into one master per filter. Okay, if it's a one-shot color, obviously it's just one master. If it's LRGB, AJ, uh, O3, whatever, then you'll need a stack for each of the different filters. And then you continue your processing. So always use one stack if you can get away with it. Not all diverse data stems from a goof of some kind. Sometimes you want to do something different. For instance, many people use a one-shot color to get their RGB and get their luminance from a mono camera. In order to do that, 
you have to calibrate your matching lights with your cal calibration frames, as always. Debear your one-shot color if you've got it, and then use one, sh and it's the sharpest luminance you've got, one reference frame for one registration with all of the subframes, whether they're one-shot color or luminance. And then integrate your one-shot colors into a master OSC and integrate your monos into a master luminance. Now you combine them as you would with any LRGB processing. So we have a number of different ways to ask the same question. It's a question about how do I handle diverse data? And the solution is pretty much the same, calibration, and registration. If you understand these two concepts and how they work, that and a little bit of cropping perhaps, a little bit of um, normalization, and you pretty much got the idea of what you need to do. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you have subs taken on different nights with different rotations and all that stuff, you know what to do. Calibrate it, register it, adjust for maybe some normalization if needed, and just carry on as normal. Thank you.